In 1987, a young man from New Orleans named Philip H. Anselmo packed his bags and moved to Dallas to join a heavy metal band called Pantera. Phil's influence on the group could not be understated as he helped transform the group from spandex-clad glam rockers into a state-of-the-art metal powerhouse and one of the biggest acts of the 90s. Their success is due in part to Anselmo's punk rock attitude and the musical and artistic influences he picked up in his native New Orleans. In the wake of Pantera's breakup, Anselmo has played an important role in metal history, as well as the history of New Orleans via projects like Down, Arson Anthem, and Super Joint Ritual. We wanted to find out what gave these New Orleans bands such a unique take on what can be a very formulaic genre. And so we set out to this fabled and much troubled city to meet the people behind the songs and hear their stories. Our first stop was Phil Anselmo's home and headquarters to House Core Records a tranquil and peaceful retreat, and birthplace to some of the angriest sounds south of the Mason-Dixon line. known for its slower music, uh, crowbar. Definitely, I think, uh, uh, even preceding that would be a graveyard rodeo. They had a very droning, slow sound, a mix with their hardcore and metal, very slow and, and powerful. It's like all of the bands have something in common, have a lot in common, but none of them sound like each other. It's weird, I don't know how to explain it. I guess because so many guys have played together, in so many bands and known each other for so many years. To me, it's a very original sound that kind of runs the whole spectrum of heavy music from doom and stoner to grind and blast beats. There's no rules, it's just be original. That's kind of what the deal, the whole idea was in the beginning anyway. For Jimmy and I, it was just kind of, we wanted something different. Everybody was playing thrash, you know, at the time. We loved it, but we also went back and started discovering other ways to be heavier. And to me, like, that's just my opinion, like, slower is heavier, mm -hmm. you know? Like a breakdown part or whatever is heavier. Uh, I think it's a, a, a combination of Mardi Gras, the darkness and the vibe of New Orleans, and the blues, man. Mm -hmm. A lot of Melvins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of Melvins, man. I was in North Carolina in COC and I brought home a, uh, I gave Jimmy Bauer a Melvin's cassette. And that kind of changed everything. Yeah. You know, I get gluey porch treatments, kind of sent all those pill popping burnouts <laughs> off to the races and it kind of <laughs> went from there. Formed in 1982 in the Pacific Northwest, the Melvins are Buzz Osborne and Dale Crow. The duo and a revolving door bassist took the sound of Black Sabbath and side B of Black Flag's My War to create an entirely new genre, sludge metal. Let's go way, way back with this, where there was an extremely big thrash and punk scene here. And then the Melvins played here, and that changed everything amongst a lot of people's attitudes on how to approach music. Once the door was open with the Melvins, then the door was open, and that brought everybody back to the basics. The thrash bands, that fucking pace bands, that had run itself into the ground. And the bare beginnings of death metal just sounded like the same thing, except faster to a lot of them. And they completely rebelled. They were like, fuck fast, let's go slow. If you play fast, you're boring. 
I think that's some of our approach was the early approach to the punk and hardcore and early thrash bands had that, hey man, we're no different than you, we're just on the other side of the barricade, you know, or we're on stage while you're looking at us, but we're dressing the same. Representing New Orleans has always been uh, top priority, man, because my whole life, man, I have pulled for the underdog. I don't care if it's sports, boxing, football, whatever, you know, as long as it's not my team, because I'm always going to pull for my team. And we have been underdogs for fucking years, so I had that opportunity to be the walking billboard. I was very conscious of it. It was very on purpose and, and, and for damn good reason. I thought they were great bands. I always have thought they were great bands. There were no better musicians than the dudes in Pantera. There were no fucking better. No, there were no nobody close. Pantera definitely had their own groove, and they had their own idea of groove. But the music that I would play, I took the stereo hostage, man, because oh, I'd have all my mixtapes with me. For New Orleans, heavy metal thrash. Exhorter had upped the game. They were going about their business without any image, without any need for club scenes, without any need for anything except a stage and their amps and the crowd and go. Ooh, the That was the mentality that I was trying to instill in Pantera. Let the music do the talking type of shit. Now that required a lot of me pounding different bands into their heads because they did not respect Exhorter. They didn't respect rigor mortis. They didn't, whereas I did. You know what I mean? They knew they were good. They knew they were fucking good and, sadly enough, looked down on other bands. And to make a long story short, Slayer befriended us. Dimebag had a chance to sit down with Kerry King from Slayer and understand how badass their riffs really fucking are and what went into it. He, he finally understood the power of it. He understood the fucking power of it. And I think that was the biggest turning point. I've played in many side bands, in bands where I play guitar, I write riffs. I've got my own little thing. I got my own little style. It is ingrained into me jamming with Jimmy Bauer, me and Kirk, me and Pepper. Fucking put it this way: I wrote the, the main riff for Mouth for War, and it's like this: ging, 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 ging. but I hand the guitar to Dimebag and he's got such a different grip and play with it that it sounds like a completely different riff. And it's like, oh, you know, go, tear it up, big boy, because I'm not a great guitar player. I'm creative. But I still have my own little fucking thing about it. And maybe it is from jamming with Jim and, and several other people, you know, on and off throughout the scene or whatever. There was a, a band that came 
cannot go without mentioning named Shell Shock. Jimmy Bauer was in a, in a band called Shell Shock when I first met him with uh, Greg Hatch on vocals and his, his older brother Hatch Boy on guitar and uh, this cat named Mike Savoy on bass. Me and Kirk, we played in another band called Shell Shock, I think from like around 80, 81. Mm -hmm. And when I was around 18, they asked me if I, I, was, if I would play for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, got to do a tour with the Exploited when I was really young. We were gonna move to San Francisco and something happened, we didn't go. What not shit happens, dude killed himself, the guitar player. And then Mike Hatch committed suicide, and that was huge. It was big and, and terrible and awful. Kirk Weinstein and, and Greg Hatch were best friends. God, I think Kirk had just joined Shell Shock. It, this scene's so damn incestuous, man. Uh, me and Jimmy met because he was playing drums in Shell Shock, and uh, all the tragedy that befell those motherfuckers, you know, there is a real doom element, you know. Mm -hmm. There is a big loss element. We, we, we've all felt it from uh, a young age, man. Pantera went on hiatus in 2001 and split by 2003 amidst a flurry of allegations, finger pointing, and a deep divide between Phil and founding guitarist Dimebag Daryl Abbott. In 2004, Dimebag and his brother Vinnie Paul formed Damage Plan, a new project with a new vocalist and what felt like a whole new start. But during the Columbus stop on Damage Plan's first U.S. tour, 25-year-old Nathan Gale shot and killed the legendary guitarist on stage. Dimebag Daryl Abbott was 38 years old. Phil Anselmo requested to attend the funeral, but was asked to stay away by the family. He recorded the following testimonial. I want to say, bless his family and all, all of his close friends. And I never got a chance to say goodbye in the right way and it kills me. And I'm so sorry. I wish to God I could have gone to his funeral, but I have to respect his family's wishes and they do not want me there. I believe I belong there, but I understand completely. I'm so sorry to his band members. I'm so sorry to the whole fucking world that love Dimebag Daryl. Because let me tell you something, there was not one motherfucker like him. You're not as busy on certain things and on the Tom things. Despite the tragedy, Anselmo is hardly the type to sit idle, keeping busy with projects like Super Joint Ritual with Jimmy Bauer, Arson Anthem with Mike Williams, Christ Inversion, and especially Down, his supergroup of New Orleans luminaries led by Jimmy Bauer behind the kit and Pepper Keenan on guitar. His latest project is Phil Anselmo and the Illegals, which he considers to be his first solo venture. Heads up and down. Heads up and down. 
Give it a try.